Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Van, and I'm the chair of the General Practice Student Network Society. Uh, welcome to the 2019 Not Just a GP Speaker Night. Tonight we'll be having five speakers, uh, Dr. Brad McKay, Dr. Harriet Nespelin, Dr. Gillian Deacon, Dr. Richard Stiles, and Dr. Shani Wu. Uh, each speaker will be talking for about 15 minutes or so. As we were lucky to have a total of five speakers, we may only have time for maybe one question at max after, just so that we don't get pushed for time. But uh, if you're around and the speakers are around, you're more than welcome to speak to them after. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge a key sponsor for the night, GP Synergy. Uh, I want to invite uh, Nicole Tuma from GP Synergy just to have a few words and to introduce our, our lucky door prize. Hi everyone, uh, I don't usually need a microphone but I will use it in this case. Um, my name is Nicole, as Van said, and I'm from GP Synergy. I'm the Senior Marketing and Events Coordinator there, so I'm definitely not specialised in uh, giving you advice on any general practitioner questions as some of you figured out this evening. Um, but uh, signing up to our mailing list will definitely help you. So a lot of people signed up this after, just before, sorry, um, and that was for our lucky door prize which is the Murtaz uh, handbook, companion handbook, and we'll be drawing that at the end of the night, I believe. Um, so just to be clear, a few people asked, what is GP Synergy? So very quickly, GP Synergy is the uh, registered training organisation for New South Wales and ACT, training doctors to specialise in general practitioning. Um, so we help deliver the training program set out by the Department of Health. Uh, and offer a diverse experience to all those within the training program, both urban and uh, within our rural areas as well. Um, any questions, of course, please ask me. If I cannot answer them, I will write them down and I will get back to you. So thank you very much for having us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, our first speaker of the night is Dr. Brad McKay. Uh, Dr. McKay started studying medicine at Monash University at the young age of 16, becoming a qualified doctor by the age of 21. He has been a fellow of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners since 2008. Dr. McKay is passionate about all aspects of medicine, especially sexual health, men's health, mental health, paediatrics and women's health. He also has Indigenous <laughs> health experience, having worked with Aboriginal communities on the central coast of New South Wales. In 2013, Dr. McKay became the medical expert and host of Embar Embarrassing Bodies Down Under, an Australian edition of a TV show designed to help reduce stigma surrounding embarrassing health conditions. Please welcome Dr. Brad McKay. <laughs> Band. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Dr. Brad McKay. Not the K, but that's fine. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was asking, what do I need to speak about tonight? And I was just told to tell my life story. So, um, so we'll take about an hour and <laughs> we'll go through all of that. Um, but yeah, so just sort of like going through what my life is. Uh, we'll see more. See where that leads. Um, and uh, what got me interested in general practice, and then um, yeah, what I'm doing now, and then what does the future look like, which is probably what Harry will be talking about as well. So, um, so yeah, so about me, um, yeah, I was born in New Zealand, which is why my accent's a little bit stuffed up, um, and then I moved over to Melbourne when I was about 13, 14 years old, and started going to school over there. Um, I skipped a year of school when I was um, just a youngin, so that's how I Start, like got accepted into medicine crazily at 16 um, and just started cutting up dead bodies when I was about 17, so that was always fun. Um, and one of my first sort of like memories of general practice, like from an Australian perspective, was um, my, my GP um, down in Melbourne. Because when I was a teenager, when I was like 15, um, 16, finishing school, um, I had a lot of pain in my back, so my, my lower back. And so I kept on going back to my GP and saying, yep, I'm a young chap, um, I have pain in my back and it's right here, um, it's getting worse as time is going on, um, it's waking me up at night time, um, 
there are a few few issues that are going on and can you sort it for me? So um, so the, the GP that I saw at the time um, sent me off to see a physio. Um, he said that, um, that, that he had back, back pain as well, he was in his 50s, and said that it was just probably the same um, with me being 14 as him being 50 um, with having lumbar spine pain. Um, even though I wasn't, like I didn't really know anatomy at that time, but I was sort of pointing more to my sacrum than my lumbar spine, but he didn't really like pick up on that. So, um, so I saw a physio, um, they didn't really get very far with massage therapy. Um, they gave me a heat pack, which they'd put on my back for about 20 minutes, and then they would come back into the room and I'd be screaming in agony, going, hey, well, no pain, no gain, so I must be getting better. Um, and um, they eventually, like the physio washed their hands from me, um, and sent me off to an osteopath instead. Um, that was what the GP organised as the next port of call. Um, and so they started bringing out their activator, um, which if you didn't know what an activator is, it's a big stick. Um, and they found the, the sorest point in my back and then pointed the stick at it and then clicked it and then I would be have to be scraped off the ceiling um, in agony. Um, so they kept on doing that. I was trying to study year 12 at the time and getting, uh, getting through towards my exams um, and going back to the osteopath every week um, and not really getting much better. Um, I'd had two CT scans of my lumbar spine um, but not really where I was pointing to. Um, so uh, that was the problem. Uh, and then somebody came in and uh, they were locoming at the osteopath and um, they just did a quick assessment and said, hey, maybe you should get a bone scan done. Um, so sent me off for a uh, bone scan, um, injected me with some dye um, and then um, just said, oh, well, you've got a massive hot spot in your sacrum. Maybe you should um, yeah, have an MRI and possibly see an orthopedic specialist for this. So, um, so I sort of went back to the GP and then was referred off to uh, an orthopedic specialist, got an MRI, and I had a rare bone tumour that I was told at medical school not to worry about learning about it, um, because it's so rare that you, you'll never see it in your life. Um, we called an osteoblastoma, um, the size of a walnut, um, sitting in my sacrum. And so that was causing all of the pain. When the physio was putting the heat pack on, it was swelling up with blood and then causing agony. Um, if you're shaking a stick at it, it doesn't really help very much either if you're just pressing the sore point. So, uh, so that was my, my introduction to general practice. Um, and I, I suppose that it inspired me to think of the rare things um, since I had one myself and cover all bases. And that's one of the things with general practice is that you end up, like somebody comes in the room, it's an undifferentiated <coughs> problem, nobody's worked them up before, and you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And I love that Sherlock Holmes aspect of everything there. Um, so when I, uh, we'll move on, I went through medical school, got into a residency, um, and I think I worked for about like three or so years um, just doing different jobs around the hospital. Um, I could never decide what I wanted to do. Um, I did a bit of renal medicine, a bit of psychiatry. Um, I got headhunted for cardiothoracic surgery, and I really didn't want to do it. Um, I really hated getting up in the morning at seven o'clock to go in and have a meeting to talk about coronary arteries. I kept on falling asleep at the back of the meeting. Um, and, and then at the, and I like, just begrudgingly did this like three month stint in cardiothoracic surgery. And at the end of it, I had my farewell session with the, uh, the head surgeon who said, oh, thank you so much for your work. We'd love to have you as part of the team um, uh, to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. I was like, hell no, I'm <laughs> not going to be part of you. you guys. No, I didn't want to do this job anyway, um, because I could see uh, a lot of the, the surgeons that were sort of, that, that was in whole life, and, and I sort of wanted to have something more outside of that, and um, I'm much more verbal, as you can probably tell, um, rather than sitting in and, and trying to, to work plumbing of, of somebody's heart. Um, I enjoy talking to my patients when they're awake. That's always a good thing, too, in my book. So, um, so I, I didn't go for that, um, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and one of my friends, um, Dr. Peter Nittlebeck, um, so he was um, a little bit older than me, uh, but we graduated at the same time. Um, just watch the time. Um, and he, um, he really influenced me. He sort of like was very keen to be a rural GP. Um, so he was married and had a couple of couple of young kids, and um, and he was he's, he was finishing off his residency. Um, this is out in Gippsland area, and um, and the hospital there was sort of like making him go through all the the rotations. 
and one of the rotations was doing night duty for paediatrics. That was his last job. Um, so he, I was very inspired. I wanted to become a GP and then have him as my, my colleague lifelong um, because we went through uh, a lot of university together, um, knew each other very well, um, very tight-knit group. Um, and then I got a call one day to tell me that he'd died. Um, <coughs> So, sorry, I'm trying not to cry. Um, so so uh, this, was, this was a long time ago, but it's still raw. Um, so what happened? Um, he was doing his last stint, his last night. Um, he'd talked to the hospital before um, out in the rural area and said, look, I really don't want to do night duty. Like, fine doing paediatrics, but can you please not put me on nights? Um, because I've got nocturnal epilepsy. And, um, and normally I'll have my wife next to me, and if I have a fit, she'll be able to turn me on my side. But if, if I'm at the hospital, um, I don't have anyone around. Um, I'm just in the room by myself, and that can be quite dangerous. And they just said, oh no, just keep on working. Um, and so it was his, um, <laughs> his last night um, working. Uh, sorry, I will come down. <laughs> um, it was his last night, um, which was really unfortunate. It was the, the final night before he was going to go and not do night duty anymore and was going to be starting to do general practice. Um, and he never got there, so uh, he never got home. Um, one of my friends, who was in the same uh, close-knit group, ended up being um, called for, um, for a code blue um, and then went running into the room to find our friend Blue um, and, and, and had died in his sleep. Um, and so that sort of like, yeah, like that really upset me around um, the, the hospital, um, how you guys can be treated at the hospital. Um, there, there's the whole Me Too movement that's happened recently and, and people are talking a lot more about um, doctors' mental health, um, doctors' physical health, trying to make work hours better, and we're, we're trying to create that better world. Um, uh, like, the, your, your seniors will hopefully <laughs> be making that a better time for you. Um, so this is a, a big problem in, in medicine, and this is what we're, what we're trying to work on uh, as time goes on. So at that time, yeah, I really didn't want to be doing physician's training. I saw that my friends were just sort of becoming ghosts, walking around the ward, um, seeing patients as numbers. And, um, and crowding around with 20 people doing an examination and petrifying patients. Um, and yeah, like I, I really decided that I wanted to get out of that environment. So I got out of the hospital and, um, and wanted to do more work in, in general practice and, uh, and started off my career uh, without my friend Peter. Um, but yeah, like making, making the best for myself. Um, so after, after that, um, I worked around lots of different jobs. So I worked, my first job was at Monbolt Family Practice um, in the outskirts of Melbourne, uh, up, in the, up in the country where they were growing tulips and pot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that was fun. Uh, then I went and did uh, Aboriginal health up in Cox Harbour. So I, um, yeah, growing up in New Zealand, um, I was very used to having um, many Polynesian Islanders around me um, and, uh, and having uh, lots of um, exposure to, to different cultures. And, um, and I found in Australia that I was taught about Aboriginal health at university, but like I really didn't get it. Like I did every, every rotation I could to sort of like try to get my head around Aboriginal health, but there were, I really didn't get it. And so that's why I went and did six months in Coffs Harbour so I could sort of like finally get it and understand what the problems are. Um, and even though they are horrendous and we're still trying to figure out the, the, the way of, of fixing them, um, I, like I'd really recommend you guys to, to work there. There's nothing that you can do otherwise, other than actually work in those environments and being um, immersed in it. Um, you can't really learn a lot of it in a classroom. Um, so after that, um, I went back to Melbourne, worked in St Kilda. That was fun. Uh, went to Richmond, um, and then just down the road from my clinic was um, Channel 10. And so I was asked to talk about, I think it was handshakes of the Olympics. How are we going to be spreading flu amongst athletes by them shaking hands? Um, and so they asked me to do like a short, like 30 second piece to camera. And I'm there going, well, oh, look, if they probably don't have the flu if they're like competing <laughs> to the best of their ability. But hey, yeah, they could potentially put on a door handle, yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so that was uh, my first part 
doing that for television. And then um, they just sort of like kept on asking me back to do more and more um, pieces to camera. Um, and then invited me down, rather than just being in the clinic, to actually go to the, the studio and, and film there. Um, and then I got a very strange email asking if I would like to audition to be the host of Embarrassing Bodies Down Under. And I was like, <laughs> um, so the UK version is like my favourite show ever, um, and then like being asked to potentially host the one here was just weird. So I thought I was being punked, um, and yeah, had to had to Google the person that was asking me, um, and then yeah, like ended up being thrown into uh, to working in a truck in Parramatta, um, seeing seeing patients in the back of a hot truck and um, trying not to gag from the stench. Um, so that, that, was, uh, that was fun. Uh, so at the moment I'm doing um, the Today Show, so on Channel 9, so um, I think that everybody's wanting to talk about flu. I was talking with Harry about that earlier on today. So um, influenza, nobody knows what influenza is. They still think it's a cold. They still think that they can get Influenza from the vaccine, which is terrible, but that just shows how we're not communicating very well to the public at the moment. Um, I do radio with ABC Sydney. Um, do I love doing the hookup, the sex show. Do you guys listen to that? There's a few nodding heads. Sunday night, the hookup, amazing. Um, what was I talking about? I was talking about allergies to sex. Like, can you be like allergic to lubricant um, or sex toys? Or what was it? A guy rang up and said that he's got like a, this really weird um, syndrome where he's, every time he orgasms, he feels um, like he just loses his energy for three or four days. And there's about 50, there's 50 people that are documented in the world. Uh, it's only been documented since 2002 of this particular condition, post-orgasmic illness syndrome, P-O-I-S, look it up. Um, and so we, I'm just asking all my immunology friends, what the hell is going on? Like, why is he losing his energy for three or four days? And it's not a Proud Boys thing, so that's something else. Um, but yeah, so then, like we, this guy called up, he's like, yeah, one of 50 in the world, and it's like a great way of actually finding these rare people, like either from embarrassing bodies or from talking on the radio, like you just, yeah, like find these amazing stories of people's health, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, uh, doing an HIV podcast as well, so I'm hosting that. Um, the other things I'm doing at the moment is pill testing. Um, so I'm trying to bring pill testing in. I've joined a, an organisation called The Loop Australia. So there's a, a bunch of doctors who are, and um, social workers and um, counsellors who are all trying to bring pill testing in so we can save young people's lives. Hey, I think it's worth it, um, even if our local government doesn't. But, um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, one of my patients got me interested in medicinal cannabis because he was wanting to not throw up his guts when he was having chemotherapy. Um, so I got interested in that in about, about three years ago. So I've been following that for a while and um, yeah, seeing how that's playing out. That's a very interesting political minefield uh, at the moment and lots of administration. Um, after today, I have to go back to the clinic and fill out some more forms to, uh, to, to, to be able to prescribe it to one of my patients. A continuing script every three months. Anyway, um, so apart from that, um, today, so overnight, I did a pre-record last night on radio for Triple M um, because Anthony Mundine had come out and, and had a tweet about how people shouldn't vaccinate their kids. Um, so that was just disgusting. So I think my voice got into the news for Triple M this morning when I went on a bit of a rant for a couple of minutes. Um, so that, that's good. Uh, and then uh, Pete Evans is always a fun person to make fun of as well. <laughs> So I've, I've had so many conversations with him, even like battling radio interviews. And every time he like, he hears me, he's like, oh, I've never heard of this Brad Mackay. I'm like, we've had a conversation. <laughs> like, like you, you, this isn't proving your point any, any, anymore. So, uh, so yeah, so that, that's an ongoing fun battle for me. Um, so where, where do I see general practice heading in the future? Um, for me, like I, I love working at the clinic, I love my patients that come in, uh, I see a lot of um, LGBTI patients that are there, I, I do a lot of HIV medicine, um, and it's, it's really enjoyable, and um, I see a, a very wide variety of people in Darlinghurst that come through the doors, it's, um, that's one of the, the things that I love. Um, mixing it up with other work, like it gives, doing general practice allows me to have the option of, of doing all of my other interests and, and talking on podcasts and being on TV and yeah, racing around, um, even flying around Australia interviewing people. Like it, it's such a, an amazing opportunity to do everything that's outside the hospital and, uh, and not having that as my, my whole life um, as just seeing patients, um, looking beyond that. 
um, doing advocacy work as well, like um, trying to, to make a change. Um, and I think general practice will sort of change um, with with the Me Too movement as well. Like I, I hope that we, like that general practitioners will be able to provide more care for other doctors, that we'll be able to provide care for, for you guys as well and um, make things better as time goes on. And um, yeah, I suppose I'm wanting you, I'll finish up soon, um, I'm wanting you guys to know that um, that we are on your side as your, your profession, uh, whatever you get into, um, that you should feel comfortable seeing your GP um, and, and seeing somebody, one of your colleagues, to talk about different problems that are going on. Um, and yeah, we, we want to make sure that, that the, the same mistakes aren't going through the generations. Um, it's still not perfect, um, but hopefully we'll have less, less deaths, like my friend Dr. Peter Nettlebeck. So um, yeah, hopefully there's a lot more opportunity for you guys as you go through. Are there any questions? <laughs> Look, I've got like four minutes to stand here. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Give or take from there. Uh, yeah, any, any questions? Yeah. How, how do you feel about like the, um, the length of GP consults? moment because I know a lot of people have the perception that it's like it can be about sort of five, ten minute appointments. Would you like to see or what's your sort of view on that, I guess? Uh, my view on it is that I like seeing patients for a longer period of time and I I I account for that in my timetable and I make sure that I have gaps and spaces that I can spend more time with patients. It means that I'm not earning as much as other GPs when I'm at the clinic, which is the problem, and it means that, um, that uh, Medicare has called me, Harry, and said that I, I have too long consultations. <laughs> So I've got a wrap on the knuckles for uh, for spending longer with patients, even though I'm not like I'm not seeing as many people. As people, so I'm actually learning less. But um, yeah, there, there's these weird rules and restrictions that are in place, and I I think that there are some loopholes and some gaps in the system, and uh, administration is is very strange in Medicare sometimes. Um, but yeah, like that that's my choice, and um, and I'm I'm happy to do that, and I get great quality in my work, and I, I appreciate having that time to spend with people. There was another question up there, somewhere? Yeah. yeah. Ask, because you do so many things other than your work. Like, I never you know, sleep. Yeah, yeah that's. Like, <laughs> like, with family and everything, like, I'm someone that I'm interested in doing GP work because I want to do so much more than just medicine. Mm. Like, is it, like, is it possible to still, you know, do that work and then and make, make enough money and do everything and, and volunteer your time and go on boards and that sort of thing. Like, how do you manage your time throughout the week and things like that? If that's something you can expand on. Yeah, so I think you can you can still earn a very good living from working uh, like a few hours. Like, you don't have to work five days a week or six or seven days a week to earn a good living from general practice. Um, so if you've got options and, and ability to, to join boards or, or other organizations, then sometimes you can get, like often it's free work, um, sometimes you can get payment from doing other, other opportunities as well. And um, yeah, I remember doing a, a GP placement when I was still a medical student and the doctor who was, uh, who was taking me under his wing said, um, never do more than three days a week, otherwise the patients will drive you mad. <laughs> Um, so, so you, you can and you can mix things up. Um, there's an there's a, um, ample opportunity for research as well in general practice. There's a big push for that at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, there are other, are other options, um, but at least it's a good backup career, um, general practice. It's something good to fall back on. It's better than, um, than working in fast food. Yeah. <laughs> cool, I'll pass back. so much to Dr. Mackay. Um, second time I've heard you speak and it's always, you've had an incredible career um, and thank you so much for sharing your story about your friend Peter as well. I think there's some really important messages for all of us in there. Um, okay, so next up we've got uh, Dr. Nespolon. 
Um, Dr. Nesplon is uh, a New South Wales based GP. He's also the current president of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. Um, so it's very special for us to have him here tonight. Um, his background includes a Master's in Business Administration, membership on a number of boards and committees, um, such as the Northern Sydney Local Health District, um, and a stint as the Chair of GP Synergy, um, who, as we know, are the key accreditation um, providers for GPs in New South Wales, um, and as well as owning two GP practices. So Dr Nesplin has also worked uh, for the Australian Medical Association as a, GP, as a RAC GP examiner, um, and representative for the Code of Conduct Committee for Austra Medicines Australia for more than 10 years. So please welcome Dr. Nesborn. First of all, um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, if someone can just wave at me at about 14 minutes, that would be great. Um, it's very hard to follow Brad, I must say. Um, P-O-Y-S. Um, I think we might put a question in the exam about P-O-Y-S. P-O-I-S, sorry. I didn't see already I failed the question. <laughs> the other uh, interesting thing is you guys are all at the back. You'll be glad to know I spent the whole of my medical career in the back row. <laughs> I felt it was very safe there. Um, occasionally I did actually come down to the front row just to see what it was like. But it was a bit scary, so I went back to the back row very quickly. Uh, so what I might start off with, um, before I get into my story, I mean, people like to talk about themselves. Um, uh, I'd like to actually get to the end of my, um, the end of the presentation, which is why I've become a GP. Uh, I can tell you that I really enjoy going to work every day, and I really mean that. I'm not just saying it because I'm here with you guys today. I love seeing my patients, and I love being a part of my patients' lives. And you don't quite get that in the hospital system. You don't quite get it until you're actually out there practising for a while. And if you ask me what's the, the best part about general practice, it's about that continuity of care, which not a lot of specialties actually offer you. Um, it, it's something that you, you know, often when you talk about general practice, people want to hear about the variety of things that you can do in general practice. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that and the ability to, to do, pursue lots of different careers like Brad has and, and I'll have to put up with my story a little bit in a minute. But being a GP is a great job. Um, look, um, I probably would say to you doing it seven days a week wears you out. Doing it five days a week is okay. Three days is probably about right. Um, so, so uh, if, you, if you're thinking about general practice, then um, do it because it is the sort of medicine that you want to do. I mean, if you're a cardiologist, for example, which I've never been, you can imagine your day going along the lines of the patient sits in front of you, don't tell me, chest pain. Next patient comes in, don't tell me, chest pain. <laughs> Next patient comes in, let me guess, chest pain. <laughs> Try and do that for 30 years. Um, one of the things that I did think about doing was obstetrics, um, which I really did enjoy because of that ability to be with your patients through a really happy part of their lives generally. Um, but then again, if you look at most of the obstetricians, they, um, you know, when, once they've done their 50,000th antenatal visit, you can see that boredom appearing on their faces. And um, so it, general practice is, is just gives you the variety and it really is interesting. It doesn't mean you can't burn out. Um, I've certainly, I'll admit, I've burnt out quite a few times during my life. And, um, and as you'll hear, I do odd things when I burn out. Um, so my story is like Brad, I was 16 when I started medicine. And at 21, I was in casualty at Flinders, um, resuscitating people. And um, I will share with you one story. I think it was the second patient I ever saw as an intern. Um, guy came in, he was having an MI. And so I said, I dutifully read up about how to deal with myocardial infarctions. And so it said, give them morphine. I thought, that sounds like a good idea. Give me some morphine, sister. And, got my 10 milligrams of morphine and I squirted it into the patient and the patient went, that's good, I went, fine. But what I did notice at the time was everyone was silent around me, not a single sound. And I did it once or two, one a few more times and I really noticed this deafening silence around me and I was going, 
was wondering, what, what, have I, what am I doing that's wrong? So I went back and looked up what I should be doing. And what it says, it says, in small aliquots, not give them a big 10, 10 milligrams straight up. And I did think it was quite odd because I was the most junior doctor in, on the ward or in the casualty at the time. Anyone could have said anything to me and I would have listened to them. And I think things have changed nowadays in, in, uh, in the hospitals, but you do need to have that sixth sense around you about, because people often in, in medicine, and I hope it is changing, will happily, um, if you do well, you don't tend to get, it's, it's quite an interesting thing, it's my personal observation, is that people won't actually say to you you're doing a great job, but they will tell you when you're not doing a good job. They tend to be silent when you're doing a great job. And, it, and sometimes doctors find that quite difficult, especially with reception staff. Receptionists are used to getting, you know, they live in the normal world, which is if you do something good, they, you say to them, well done. But what doctors tend to do, and I've certainly observed this over the years, is they tend to lay into receptionists when they're doing a bad job, but never when they're doing a good job. And you should think about how you treat your colleagues. Um, because, I know I'm getting a little bit sidetracked, I mean, I am on the board of local health district, and you know, one of the problems is you know, when you ring up from casualty at two o'clock in the morning and you've got a, um, you know, a physician who's really tired, you know, they tend to scream and shout at you down the line, now, why are you ringing me up at this time? And I hope that by the time you guys get there, that's changed, and it's certainly something that we are trying to change. So at 21, after I'd worked out how to deliver morphine to people with myocardial infarctions, they actually let me get through. I did obstetrics training, which I uh, did a diploma of obstetrics, which I really enjoyed. And then I thought to myself, you're dead for a very long time. And the idea of fighting it out in a, in a specialist training program was sort of the last thing that I wanted to do. And so I went out into the big wide world. Um, and so there wasn't a training program in those days. It's ancient history, that's why I've got the grey hair. Um, so I went off and worked in a, in a general practice uh, by myself, effectively. I was doing um, holiday duties and I was there by myself. It wasn't that exciting an event, let me tell you. Um, but I'd also enrolled in law at that stage and economics. And, um, and economics is my most favourite degree that I did. Um, it tells you more about human behaviour and act accurately predicting human behaviour than almost any other of the many courses that I've done. So I did economics law, and while I was doing that, I was the, um, uh, the, uh, the medical registrar at one of the peripheral hospitals. And um, that was interesting. Um, you learnt about team skills, you learnt about people panicking in uh, acute situations, but I was clearly not adequately trained to be the night medical registrar in a tertiary hospital. So I decided at that point in time that perhaps I should stop doing that because it wasn't a safe thing to do. Um, didn't have anyone die, I might add. Um, so after that, I actually, um, all my friends were getting married. For those of you old enough to remember Skyhooks, which I don't think any of you are. Um, well done, Julian. Um, and so uh, most of my friends at that stage in life were all going off having kids and, um, and my nights, you know, the, the amount of times I could go out was, I mean, I could go out every night, but then my group was sort of suddenly disappearing. And so I actually applied for a job and um, not for the AMA, I might add, but I got a call from the AMA saying, why don't you come to Canberra and, and work as a lobbyist, um, which I did. And that was, I really enjoyed it. It was a very good experience. Um, and yeah, you learn a lot about politics, you learn a lot about our politicians, you learn a lot about health. You know, one of the things I would say to you is, does anyone know that a, a hospital that's been built in the right place? No. For those of you who uh, have heard about the Royal Adelaide Hospital, which is the, was the most expensive uh, building in the world at one stage, I think it cost $2 billion to build. Uh, if, you, if you know Adelaide, which you might not, it's it's got almost no one that lives in the city, but there's this massive hospital on the edge of the city. And why is it there? It's not there because patients want to go there. It's there because the specialists don't want to drive too far away from their very nice suburbs. Um, and believe it or not, that's uh, even my hospital, in which I was uh, graduated from Flinders, is probably five kilometres too close to the city. In fact, probably about 20 kilometres too close to the city. 
Um, and so you learn very quickly that medicine is about, uh, a lot of medicine is about politics. And, um, and so it's certainly something that I've enjoyed, um, the politics side of it. So I was working at the AMA for about three and a half years. You do have used by life in these, um, in these sorts of organisations, which is about two years. And I was there for about three and a half years and I certainly had exceeded my use by date by a very long way. Um, I had um, a new president was elected and the, the former president rang me up and said, you know that so-and-so is out to get you. And I said, no shit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you learn that probably that's the time to move on. I will get, we'll move on a bit faster. Um, and then um, at that point in time, I did start an MBA um, by, um, I think they call it by distance, I call it by correspondence. It's really hard doing a, a course and um, tr a working and trying to do your course. So I came to Sydney and I did my MBA in, um, at uh, the Australian Graduate School of Management. Um, and that's what I tend to do when I get burnt out. I tend to go off and do degrees. <laughs> because I love doing degrees. You guys have got a great time in your life at the moment, let me tell you. You have no responsibility, which is fantastic, um, I, and you can, you, know, you can do what you want. Then all of a sudden you go off and you become an intern and buy cars and get married, have children, all that sort of responsibility stuff. Life really changes. Um, so I did my MBA and I finished that and I actually was a management consultant for a couple of years and um, in one of the bigger law and the bigger management consulting firms. Um, and about that time I decided I needed to grow up. And so um, I did management consulting for a couple of years and then I opened my general practice, my first general practice in Neutral Bay. Um, and that was an interesting time. Um, I think I was asked about what are the challenges. Nothing more exciting than sitting in your brand new general practice, no patients, the receptionist at the front earning more money than you are. <laughs> and you're there more hours than she is. And, um, and that's, that's what starting a practice is like. Things have moved on a bit from then. Um, but the thing that it really taught me was, as a, as a practitioner, as a real full-time GP at that stage, I should say I practiced general practice all the way through my career ever since I've left me uh, medical school. And for the question from before, um, you know, rarely a year or rarely any time would go by where I wasn't doing at least a day's general practice um, each week. Um, and, you know, that you can say it's because of the love of general practice, which is just crap. I just needed the money. Um, so, um, so, and then I opened my first practice. Um, surprisingly, it um, succeeded. It, it, um, it's still there today. In fact, it's moved three times. Um, I've got another practice in Pitt Street in the city, um, which um, I opened, dare I say it, with a pharmacist friend of mine who's now in Ireland. Um, and so when it comes to rural medicine, as I often say, I'm the antithesis of rural medicine. You cannot get any, anyone that's any closer to the city than I am. Um, I'm just 300 metres, 400 metres down the road from Macquarie Bank. Um, as some of you know, known as the Millionaires Factory. I ask every single person from Macquarie's Bank, Macquarie Bank, are you a millionaire? Haven't found anyone yet. <laughs> so I think they're telling fibs. Um, the other things that I've done is I did I started, um, I won't go through my board uh, career, but uh, you've heard about GP Synergy tonight. GP Synergy started off as a little tiny, what was called regional training uh, provider in those days. Uh, the, the rooms were so small that um, I think I was chair at the time. Uh, the CEO came up to me and said, we don't have enough room for a photocopier. And I said, probably time will move out. Um, <laughs> So we started off as, I think we had 20 something um, uh, uh, registrars when we started off. And although you guys probably don't know it, I was, I was um, thank you, um, is that 15 or close? 14, excellent. Um, and so um, at that point in time, um, we uh, recently we um, won all the, um, the, uh, all the contracts for New South Wales, so we train can't say we anymore. Um, we train uh, GP Synergy trains uh, 3,000 GPs, so that's a third of all of general practice. Um, and so part of my role was I did actually go back onto the board at that stage was to stiffen the spine of the board to make sure that we were going for all of them, because I was very proud of what GP Synergy does. 
In the last little while, um, one of my more recent tasks is becoming president of the College of General Practitioners. Um, today, as some of you know, was election day. If you want to know what a day in the life of a president is, um, started this morning off at six o'clock in the middle of Brisbane, um, got driven out to uh, a general practice in the poorer parts of Brisbane. We launched our election campaign. Um, since then, I've been doing sort of one interview after the other um, on radio. Um, I got a message from our media people uh, to say that we've um, gone into about 5.5 million people have actually heard the message um, today. And so that's what part of what I'm trying to do at the moment is to make life better for general practitioners going into the future. Um, we are the backbone, I'll give you my political um, political speech, you know, general practice is the backbone of our um, medical system. Without general practice, um, we would be doing horrible things like the Americans do and spending an enormous amount of money without very much output. So I, to finish off, um, general practice, you should do it because you want to be a GP. It does offer you the ability to provide, you know, you can do a whole lot of other things uh, other than being a GP. Um, you can be on boards, you can become presidents of the college, you can do TV work, you can, um, you know, you can do um, lots of legal stuff if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but the most important thing about general practice is your patients. And your patients really are the, the patients really are the soul of general practice and what makes it really fantastic. So if you're thinking about doing it, just do it. So our next speaker is Dr. Um, Gillian Deakin. So Dr. Deakin completed her medical degree at the University of Sydney before undertaking three years of postgraduate research with the Baker Medical Research Institute. This included a year in Antarctica, which is very cool, um, which led to her doctorate of medicine. She then went on to complete a master's degree in public health at the University of Sydney. After completing her GP training, Dr. Deacon and her family travelled to work in Kiribati, which um, as you said is a tropical paradise and also um, a low resource setting. Um, since returning to Sydney, she has worked mainly as a GP and she has also written a book, 101 Things um, Your GP Would Tell You If There Was Only Time, which she's got. And um, Dr. Deacon is also one of my really good friends, GP, and she's been seeing you for a million years and she's always said lovely things about you, so <laughs> she's a good one. <laughs> just great to be here. I came once before and I really, really enjoyed an opportunity to talk to you guys because um, you, I think it's really great that you're showing an interest in general practice and I'll declare myself as a GP chauvinist. It is definitely the best job and, and we do the best job and we have the most fun. And I think you're getting a sense of that, um, that I'm going to be Dr. Ukud. Well, let's say I graduated in 81 as a 22-year-old. I was a late developer and, um, <laughs> and so, and so um, you know, I've been now, I'm in my 60s and I'm still loving it I'm, and I mean it and I think um, I think my patients also know that. I think they know when they come in, they enjoy, I enjoy seeing them. And that gives them something as well. So I want you to know that whatever you do, try and find the job that you enjoy because the benefits are, you know, are go far and wide. The adventure, you know, it, it, is a, it is a total adventure and I hope you never lose sight of that. So um, it is, um, I'm still loving it. I think you can see that. Might need some help you just try that. Yeah, so medicine, adventure, and I think most of us go into it originally with some idea that we might be able to do some good for people. Um, I think that's very true. I went in also because I saw it as a combination of art and science, and I think the art uh, continues to grow, and I think it gets more important as I get older. Um, and, um, yeah, that, that's the best line, I think, for me. It's um, fantastic that I still find more and more to learn every day and I will never ever know enough and 
also I have to relearn the stuff that I've forgotten from 30 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, why be a GP? I think you're getting a sense tonight, I think, that it's a huge variety in the in what it does for us, isn't it? There's a huge variety in how you live, what, what patients you see, how you treat them. When that door shuts and it's just myself and a patient in the room, the variety of the, com the style of the conversation and, and um, what goes on is, is immense. It's as, as unique as the person in front of you. And my last patient was a 19-year-old boy that made me a little bit late tonight because he's, I knew um, he was there when he, I was there when he came into the world. He's now 19. He came in with his mum. Um, he's a bit freaked out because he sort of read Nishi and you need to know who Nishi is, guys. You know, you've got to read, you've got to know the stuff, so make sure you know who Nishi is. Uh, Nietzsche, however you want to say. Um, read him, Nietzsche knew that he felt he might go mad and this guy was really freaked out because he thought that maybe he might go mad and he couldn't sleep because of that thought. And so, and I did a mental health assessment and he's perfectly balanced and he's going to work and he's studying and he's got good friends and his mum's not worried about him. But this thought frightened the hell out of him. And so then what do you do? I mean, do you learn how to do that in medical school? Do you learn how to handle that sort of thing? You've got to work out how you're going to help this guy. Do you send him off to a sh shrink and freak him out further? Or do you sort of reason with him? And the GP who knows him for so long and he... He trusts me, and so I was able to tell him there's nothing insane about anything you have. You just got, you know, you've got a vivid imagination. You've got to just um, learn how to manage it. We, the conversation went on a bit longer than that, but the point is that um, that's up to us to kind of protect him and help him through a slightly tricky moment for him. It's, pretty, it's fun. It's great. Anyway, um, yeah, there's enormous scope and opportunities to work virtually anywhere, and you'll probably see that I've taken that to some extremes. Um, and the other thing, it's pretty easy for us to change, you know, that's the thing. If you don't like where you are, you can easily just up, up and move and go somewhere else. So it's, that's a lot easier for us than it is if you're a kind of a paediatric neurologist or something. You really don't have too many job opportunities. So um, the money is good. So, you know, you might hear that other people earn more money. You're going to end up with your car and you're going to get your house and, you know, your kids will go through private school if that's your thing. You'll be fine, okay? Um, uh, so just don't sweat it too much. You know, a bit of common sense and a bit of, you know, planning and you'll be fine. Um, so um, intellectual challenge, yes. Um, coughs and colds, just so not, is it? So not cough and colds. Don't even begin to think that. All my patients know better than coming to me with a cough or a cold, you know. <laughs> they get very short shrift, you know. Um, but uh, if someone actually does come in with, <laughs> I've got this cough, you go, what's the real reason you're here? You know, it's never the cough or cold, is it? There is, there's always a, a subtext. It's their pretext to come in. But what they really want to, what's really interesting, what the real reason that they're there. Um, so... Um, most important of all, um, you know, you're, you're part of a community. And I think um, Brad made reference and Harry made reference to that as well, that the notion that I am seeing this kid that I've known for 19 years um, is really um, uh, something I really value. And, and it just gets richer and richer as the family histories entwine and things happen. Um, you're many things to your patients. You're their friend and, and uh, you're certainly a confidant. Um, you are trusted as a source of information. Um, you're a source of information and you're often a comfort to them. And you're certainly a witness. Uh, you, you bear witness to extraordinary events that sometimes the, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. Um, so I'm encouraging you to kind of take the helm. I was once young, I just want to prove that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, uh, and um, I just want you to make sure that you have a sense of your own, own destiny and you don't just you know, drift around. But drift a, a little bit, just make sure that you have an idea of where you're fulfilling what you want in your life. Um, educate yourself as widely as you can. I think that's the point. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, there, there. So you, you can find yourself in some pretty tricky situations. You know, I you know, had to deliver a baby I had no plan to do, and um, I've done all sorts of things. I've treated camels. I've done all sorts of things. You know? and, so, um, and so you just never know when you need what information. And as a doctor, you'll have people asking you all sorts of things all the time. And so be as informed as you can. Um, 
it's never just about the medicine, you know, um, you know, travel, travel around, see things, learn things. Um, and your ticket as a doctor, and particularly as a GP, opens up your life to all, all manner of possibilities. You know, I could work in remote and, um, places, but I've got a broad medical basis, and often, you know, you're working with pretty basic in, you know, equipment. Well, that's what general practice has. So we're well equipped to work in very remote and um, extraordinary places, and that's something that, you know, again, the, the cardiologists who were getting derided earlier um, uh, just don't have that opportunity. So you just remember that you are, if you do take that specialty, that's your fate. You're, you're really going to be in the hospital. So this is um, much better for that. And um, as I said, if you don't like your job, you change it. I took a job, as mentioned, down in Antarctica, and that's us, you know, pulling into port, <laughs> edge of an ice, um, the, the sea ice. And um, I had a year down there, and that's when I wrote my MD. So you can have your cake and eat it. You can do a lot of things. That's combining research, combining adventure, and combining um, clinical medicine. And that's the whole thing. You just keep thinking and mixing it up, you know, adding on the layers. Some, um, um, and that's something you can do. That's just a sun shot. That's a midnight sun, multiple exposure, um, midday. And, um, you know, you might think, oh, that's risky. I mean, what could be risky when you're out there in the middle of the sea ice and the a vehicle falls through the sea ice, and there we are, you know, 400 miles from uh, the nearest base. But um, what, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? You know? <laughs> but um, uh, um, seriously, though, actually, I think I run a higher risk cycling to work in Sydney than I do out doing that. I actually do. I actually, you know, when you add up the real risks. So um, people often make emotional decisions about risk. And I think you really should say, What's my chances of not surviving this? And really weigh it up carefully and think about it before you discuss, say, oh, no, that could be dangerous, you know. Um, think. Yeah, don't just act like that. Cute chop. Um, you know, never stop learning. That's me learning how to fly. I did a job as a crew doctor. That was fun. I worked out on Birkin Wheels. I was um, 10 weeks in the desert um, with, as I say, camels. <laughs> a lot of 100 people on a film set. And Brad would know what it's like, um, film people are uh, quite crazy and, um, <laughs> and there's um, it, quite extraordinary things happen so uh, um, it's quite a good fun thing to do if you get a chance so to do that. That's the second film we did on a Greek island when I had my little baby and um, had, he was four months at the time when we went over to Greek island. So don't miss out on the ultimate adventure, they're my little darlings. The one on the left is now Doctor at um, Prince Wales, so um, registrar. Uh, one on the right is a nurse at Prince Wales. Um, but whenever you do have kids, don't let that necessarily stop you too much. They were still portable. I had one under each arm when I ended up in Kiribati, um, and uh, it was a great time. I went out there, run a, I ran a, um, a, a program out there on nutrition. Um, so uh, come back and always keep the balance. As Harry made the point that um, you know the risk of us burning out and doing too much, we've got that sort of personalities, a lot of us. We're kind of high achievers and expect a lot from ourselves and push ourselves a lot. You're the one that's just got to know your limits. And you know your limits when you're just getting a bit tired, you can't stop thinking, you can't relax, you lose your sense of humour. Um, if any of that ever happens, these are all clues, guys. Stop, go and get help, pull back, take a change. So. Um, uh, I've always done yoga, I've done yoga all my life, recommend it. Um, um, and then also I did a bit of flying doctors, so that's always a great thing to do. So uh, just find some time. I mean, I'm, I've been now working mm, uh, 30, mm, eight years or something, you know, like a long time, and, um, and I've still got at least 20 years left in me, and I'm still loving it. And what I'm trying to say to you is that there's time to do a lot of different things, you know, and in general practice, that's what you can do. So as I'm saying, you know, flying doctor's great fun, you know, so um, fear of missing out. You know, when you're doing all these things, you might think, oh, I'll never get the home or the practice or things like that. Just me, you will, okay? Just plan it and you, you'll do it. That's my little surgery on Bondi Road. Um, and so, um, and so, and then, but opportunities came. I was once just got this phone call from this lo lovely lady on your right. Um, she says, oh, Dr. Deacon, can you come to Bhutan? And I go, sure. And she goes, very good, very good. I said, she goes, when, when would you like me to come? Oh, oh, in two weeks. I went, oh, <laughs> um, okay, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> and they go, what do you want me to bring? And she says, oh, just, you know, bring stuff, you know. And so, um, <laughs> so it's just kind of, a, a 
Anyway, I ended up going to Bhutan, I won't give you the whole story, but it was, a, it was pretty crazy, so have fun. Um, so locums, locums are another thing you can do in general practice, of course. So you're doing one job in the city. This was a two-week locum I did up at um, Nullumboy, which is right up in Northern Territory, and um, that just, you know, change of scenery. And it's also a great opportunity to uh, give back some of the, you know, harder positions out in the country. You can always give the doctors out there a bit of a break. I strongly recommend it if you end up in general practice. Um, yeah, that was uh, Ladakh. Yep. Um, so don't ever give up on your dreams. It took me a long, 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 long time to get to Medicine Sans Frontier. I tried and it's quite a big commitment. They need you to be sort of fairly unencumbered. So I had to kind of offload the kids and stabilise the practice and you know, you know, sort out finances and things. And finally I was able to take that year away as a volunteer. And I ended up surprisingly in the middle of the Ebola crisis, which I thought I was end up in Africa. I ended up in Moscow and that's a little clinic I set up with my Russian doctor and, and so on. So um, uh, that was a great year. And I, and I do recommend the MSF if you feel inclined. Um, Think about that. Um, get outside your comfort zone. This is, I think you're sensing that so place I've spent a bit of time. I know about that. Uh, that's the Zartary refugee camp where I ended up in the war, you know, the Syrian conflict. This is the, the international team that I work with um, of doctors and orthopedic <coughs> surgeons, and I ended up running an orthopedic ward like I know how, you know, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so um, yeah, it, that was pretty outside my comfort zone. Um, you get a chance to see some beautiful places and so you've always got to try and find time to find places that you do enjoy and, um, and um, spend time in nature. Nature's a great uh, healer and I prescribe it regularly for my patients and I certainly take it in large doses myself. So spending time in nature to rebalance very important. Every little bit helps. That's a tiny bit of donation I did. If you get a chance when you go somewhere, just bring stuff, do what you can. You know, it, it, all, it all adds up. Make lots of friends. Um, that's us in the camp, and um, that's the camp I worked at for four months in 2015, and it was really good. That's my pa. He was a physician. Um, always have a mentor, at least one. Just don't hesitate. You can use us, I'm sure everyone here with or happy to have phone calls. Um, if you ever want to ask a question, try something, what do you think about this, don't, don't hesitate. Just see, see if you can find someone who can um, uh, help you along the way. Um, but always keep the big picture, which is we're here to you know, do something useful and hopefully save a few lives or maybe at least make people's lives more comfortable. Um, but make sure you enjoy the ride is what I strongly recommend. And I'm hoping you're sensing that you definitely can in general practice. Um, it's great, I love it. And so um, it's a beautiful thing when a career and a passion come together. And that's, that's what you're out to learn, what, how you can achieve that. And I'm very passionate about general practice. I strongly believe it is the strength of the Australian healthcare system. Uh, without the, the work that general practice do every day, we're incredibly efficient what we pack in. Um, a good GP can really, um, cram a lot of good medicine in, in a very, very short period of time, in one room, with very limited testing. That's what we do. Um, we don't do 10,000 tests, we make the diagnosis and we move on, yeah? That's what we do, and so um, I encourage you to embrace that. It's easy to be a bad GP, it's hard to be a good GP, but it's very rewarding to make that effort. So I encourage you to, if you're going to do it, just um, think about that. So Phil, who means join the conversation? Um, you're very welcome to ask me any questions. I'm going to donate them to the right. I've got a question. Do you know a lot of young medical students have reservations about general practice? And one of them that I've heard is, oh, it's quite lonely, you're not working in a team like you are in a hospital. And I sense that you have a very strong connection with your patients, um, and it's a, it's a kind of very intense interaction with them. So could you maybe just speak a little bit about that quickly, your experience of that? Yeah, sure. I think that's exactly true. I, sometimes I feel guilty that I'm getting paid uh, by my patients because it is such an enjoyable and rewarding thing, these deep relationships. 
you're not allowed to use the word love because love usually means something that you're taking for yourself, whereas usually the process is one where you're giving back to the person who's in front of you. But there is something very akin to it. I think they say if you, if you care about one person, you call it love. If you care about thousands, it's more like being a doctor, you know. Um, and, um, and so, um, so that's what you do, you know, that one and that one and that one, you know. And so, but you're right, each one of those um, experiences is, is quite um, rich. There's layers there. There's, you know, when you're seeing them, you've got to know your basic medicine, okay? Someone comes in, they've got that cough. You've got to know what you're looking at. You've got to do your medicine first. Then you've got to know what's their social background, their financial background, in a sense, their family background, their genetic background, you know, their psychological background, their medication background. You, know. you need to layer on and layer on and layer on. And, and, um, but mainly that there's a, a big part of general practice, which is just saying, you know, are you okay in that deep sense? And we, we ask that question and we really want the answer. You know. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is very um, gratifying to be able to see that people rely on you and can trust you. Um, and, um, you know, and it's also an honest relationship that we know, we don't pretend that we know everything. We always say, I want you to tell it, tell me if there's something that's not quite right for you. We often send people away, you know, I think this is going to be better by Saturday, but I'm definitely going to want to see you back if you're not right. Yeah, that's what we say. So, you know, we factor in uh, the the guest rate. You know, that headache we think is just an ordinary one. You know, it looks like it, seems like it. We're expecting them to come back. So, there, you know, a lot of our work is based on that time factor and the trust that they'll come back and, and share um, how things have panned out. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. But, yeah, the, the, it is, you go into general practice really if you enjoy people. You know, if you really enjoy and you get kind of a kick out of understanding and learning about human nature, the human condition. Yeah, so anyone else got any questions? So, and do try and do some research. That was fun. Did you all get your hep B shot as babies? Did you all get that? That's me. I wrote that policy. So, <laughs> sorry, guys. Yeah, towards a um, hepatitis B vaccination policy. Because back then, just before you guys were born, the hep, hep B rates were going up. We had the vaccine, but the rates were going up or failing, or failing quite badly at the time. So universal vaccination was brought in. So, so you, know, you can make some change. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Deakin, that was very inspiring, so thank you for sharing your story. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Richard Stiles. Dr. Stiles works rurally in Lithgow as a GP surgeon and endoscopist. He currently works both in Lithgow District Hospital and Lithgow Community Private Day Surgery Centre. He also completed a master's degree in bioethics with a strong in interest in moral and political philosophy. And he has been heavily engaged in rural medicine, sorry, rural medical political issues throughout his career. When he's not practicing medicine, Dr. Stars enjoys adventure sports such as climbing, kayaking, and surfing. So please welcome Dr. Stars. Um, I suppose I just wanted to start by just kind of acknowledging the, um, <laughs> just the remarkable people that we, we heard from tonight. Um, you know, when you talk about just a GP, um, there's a lot of things that you can feel for being just a GP, aren't there? So, um, you know, I mean, these people are probably, you know, some of our high achievers within the general practice community, yeah. in terms of the public high achievers, but I think what they're talking about, what keeps them alive, uh, is some of that common stuff that every GP feels when they're doing their consultation, which is that very grounded local connection with an individual person. So um, when I was asked to give this talk, um, you know, that was going to be 20 minutes, and it's 15 minutes, and that and it sort of made me think, um, you know, it's going to get to be a bit like the Smith song, where, you know, 
If you have five seconds to spare, then I'll tell you the story of my life. <laughs> so I thought I could talk about my story, but maybe that would be interesting, but it's, all, it's more about trying to help you guys work out what you want to do with your lives tonight. And so I'm trying to weave a little bit of my story and some of the maybe the lessons or the perspectives that I bring into that are to try and offer something for you to, to, to help you work through that. And maybe when I get to 13 minutes, if you can just... <laughs> <laughs> so um, I haven't got this particularly, you know, I'm not like I'm preparing a speech for, you know, accepting the presence of the of the or something. <laughs> so it's a little bit all over the place, but just bear with me. Um, so the things that I wanted, the main things I wanted to say is learn your craft well, um, both the science and the art. Um, and it's mostly not that hard now to be a reasonable doctor, you know, with the access to information that, that we have now. I keep telling this, the, not, the students, mostly Notre Dame students, that come up uh, as medical students in Lithgow that. I don't think you have to be that intelligent to be a doctor. <laughs> um, I think you have to have a certain form of the standard form of intelligence to get into medicine. But I think I think there's different sorts of intelligence that that help you to be a doctor. You know, it's not this it's not the sort of hyper rational you know, I was with my uncle this week who um, Topped his HSC when he did it back in the fifties, and he worked on the maths that sent the first men to the moon. Um, he's very good rationally. He probably also had Asperger's. He's kind of a bit unusual emotion. Um, and I think GPs, well, doctors and GPs, I think have different sources of intelligence. But it's not, it's not that kind of. You don't have to be a brilliant mathematician or physicist. You need to know about pattern recognition. Maybe that requires some degree of intelligence. Uh, I think it's good as a doctor to be thorough. I think there's a lot of good doctors I know that aren't that brilliant, but they're thorough, and so they don't miss things. You've got to have certain mindsets, like what what is the important thing that I shouldn't be missing here? Because I think we naturally hunt towards that's going to be okay. But I think as a doctor, like when I'm looking at, at, a, at a mole, I'm thinking, could this be a melanoma? Not, might it not be a melanoma, but could it be a melanoma? And I think because I've had that mindset, I've picked up a lot of early melanomas. And that's probably one of the most satisfying parts of my job because you know, I remove a lot of bowel faults. Uh, and that might save someone. But you know if you've picked up an early melanoma, pretty much save that person's life. And that's a really good thing. So, so there are different kinds of mindsets and intelligences, I think, that you bring to medicine. But they're not always the classic, uh, traditional genius kind of. I mean, there are brilliant researchers that, that, that paradigm shift, but they're not the usual you know, sort of doctor. So it feels good to be a doctor, to be a good doctor, or to try and be a good doctor. Um, and the other part that I want to encourage you is just to really embrace your particular expression of humanity um, in whatever form that is, you know, whether it's that you like Japanese flower arranging or whether you're, you know, into, like me, sort of environmental activism or, um, you know, you a buff about 60s music or whatever it is, just um, just really embrace that. And I think I think particularly there are a lot of doctors who are quite good with the arts, and I think they often feel suppressed a bit in medicine. That you know you've got to be clinical and scientific, and and I think so much of medicine is not about that. And I think um, if you can bring in that broader person of who you are, uh, you're going to feel better in yourself and I think you're going to be able to be a better doctor. So 
a happy doctor, I think, is a happy patient. Um, and, and don't feel, particularly if you are more into the arts, um, don't feel that should be sort of separated from your medicine. I think it's really important that we have doctors who, who fill that space. Um, so, and, and by finding out about, by reflecting on who you are, think about what areas of medicine would work best for you. And because it's a very broad field. Um, and so I'm giving a few perspectives about that tonight. Um, so, a GP kind of, a lot of it is, is, has already been said, but for me, a GP turns particularly around being interested in, in particular people's stories. I think that one of the satisfying things that many of our previous speakers have said has been following people's stories over time, often in a whole family context, often in unusual circumstances. You know, I've had to look after a woman who was being beaten up by her husband, who was one of the prominent cops in the town that I worked in. And in a small town, there's a whole lot of complexities around that. Um, so they're not all kind of feel-good stories, but they are engaging stories to be part of. Um, you're very locally connected as a GP. You, know, you may not be, well, some of these previous are giving you big policy sort of in, Influences, but many GPs are primarily invested in a local area of the community. And for some people, that's really satisfying. Um, and it's an interest in blending social care with disease care. I think that's one of the nice things about general practice is that there is this flow between the social and the organic disease stuff. Um, and so I think. To be a good GP, I think most good GPs do like being with people, um, talking often and hopefully listening a bit. Um, I think if you don't really like spending a lot of time with people, then um, there's probably better areas of medicine to be involved. Because in a consulting room, you're just there talking, listening. Hopefully, then they're listening and talking. Uh, it is a very much a people discipline. So my career, um, I, uh, I grew up in Sydney. I enjoyed being exposed to rural locations growing up. My mother was a rural sociologist. Um, so I wanted to, to go out to the country when I finished my medical uh, course. Uh, I'm a, a bit of a generalist at heart. I like doing a bit of a lot of things, and I think that's an, a, another thing to think about. What sort of person you are? Some people like to know a lot about a particular area and feel that they know it really well. Whereas a generalist, you like to grab on for lots of little bits and pieces, and, and you're always kind of the, 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 I suppose the distractor is you can get lost down lots of rabbit holes because you like going down. So for me, that, that variety of general practice and rural practice offered a big scope of medicine that suited my personality. There are procedural options, which I enjoy. I enjoy doing things with my technical things in my hands. There's a particular mindset, I think, to do procedural things well, that you either have or you need to learn. I've talked about that with students that are coming through. Um, there are a lot of surgeons that are not necessarily good proceduralists. So that's another personality thing. Um, and general practice at that stage for us, we could afford us to do a lot of travel and have some lifestyle options that were so available to like going into surgical training and stuff like that. So, um, so I spent a lot of my showing my wife here um, of after 30 years. Um, we spent a lot of our 20s traveling and adventuring. She said I spent more time sleeping with my climbing partners on our honeymoon than I did with her. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so over that period I've done a lot of uh, outdoor adventure stuff with um, you know, multi-day big wall climbing in the sunny year and uh, 
guys. And there's going to be challenging peaks in New Zealand and South America and it's solo pipe trip across that strait, type of around Australia ones. Um, so lots of surfing, big power skiing, all sorts of stuff. Um, and a lot of travel, you know, we travel to I turn my rest of the continents in the world um, during their medical student days and, and after that. So that was, that was a great aspect of our training that we had that flexibility to do a lot of travel. Um, and the other thing I'm encouraging, as has been shown by the previous speakers, is that whatever career you go in, but general practice is very good for this, you can move in your interests. And so I've had a lifelong interest in philosophy. I got, I got, came back to becoming more engaged in moral philosophy through the writings of Peter Singer, the animal rights guy, uh, and I did a master's in bioethics, but more interested in the moral philosophy aspect than the real bioethics, the human health ethics. And so that's the last 10 years I've just been interested in continuing to explore that. I have an ongoing interest in the whole notion around human sustainability and, and around particularly around some of the political forms that we might need to think about to try and achieve that. So that's in some ways my next step. Um, for many years I was quite passionate about rural politics and was involved with ACRIM and the RDA and, uh, and I'm still involved in a few of those committees but, but I suppose my passions have, have, have evolved over my life. Uh, I've been involved in Lithgow as a coal mining town in quite a lot of local uh, environmental activism. Uh, and a little plug for anyone who's interested in that stuff. I think doctors, as an uh, engaged, intelligent community of people, are often underrepresented in terms of advocating on these massive social issues that we're needing to negotiate. So, <coughs> a little plug for doctors for the environment. Very well run group, I think, uh, that try and use the platform that we have as doctors to educate around those issues. Um, the problems for me of that career choice was it was often difficult to integrate my career interests with Shani's. I think maybe part of your thing was that probably general practice didn't suit you so well. Uh, and that you had to you know, negotiate around them a little bit. Um, you had a fascinating story around that. Um, living away from the ocean was pretty, I'm, you know, my, my life on passionate surfing, so in all my rural surgical jobs have always been in there. Um, so, uh, but we're back in Sydney for a bit at the moment, so it's great to be able to be back in the ocean. And um, it's in hospital medicine, it's been harder to take longer blocks of time off. And I think just having this longer periods of time because the hospital loss has been a downside of that. Of my, my so, um, so my offerings are, think about who you are. Think about that whole Socrates know yourself stuff. Are you, are you a specialist at heart? Are you a generalist at heart? You like talking, you like technical gadgets. Shani loves those anesthetic machine gadgets, you know, and physiology and pharmacology. And, um, do you, are you interested in research? Are you more interested in service delivery or of, of helping the individual person? Is getting a lot of money really important to you? How much money do you want? You know, if you think about that at the beginning. I think most areas of medicine will get you a reasonable income. Uh, but if you really want that waterfront place down in more clues, probably change the language languages. <laughs> <laughs> there are some areas of medicine that are good. Um, rural or urban? Think about, you know, rural is more diverse than you might think. My most interesting experience of community has been living in black and blue mountains. It's been fantastic. Procedural or non-procedural, lifestyle, you know, are you good if you're sleep deprived? Can you party all night and 
be okay at lectures the next day, or are you just wiped out for days? You know, if you're wiped out, maybe obstetrics is not doing that for <laughs> <laughs> um, How important are your other interests? I would really encourage you, if you have them, to keep them alive. One of my mentors, who hasn't always lived like this, said, it's a tragedy to be born a human and die a doctor. <laughs> keep, keep, keep your human, human humanity and your extra medical interests alive and well because they will help you in medicine as well. So you can't have it all, you try to, but you can't have it all. And so you just gotta think about all those, you know, there are some of the value systems, value issues you've got to decide. Which ones are the most important to you? and try and kind of shape your lives around what, what works for you as a person. What really works for you as a person. Not what you're trying to fit your personality into. I think these three remarkable people have found ways of, from what I can hear, of finding what's alive in their personhood and finding career pathways that fit that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Styles, for that very uh, awesome take on your career and on being a GP. Um, so we've come to our final speaker of the night, which is Dr. Shiny Wu. Um, I don't actually have too much info on you, so you'll have to elaborate a bit more uh, on that. Uh, but Dr. Wu is a full-time mother, um, wife, as well as a GP, a rural GP, um, anaesthetist in uh, Lithgow. Uh, she spends her time, yeah, balancing a busy life um, with her ophthalmic anaesthesia research. So, welcome up now. all my letters behind. I just want to introduce myself with what means the most to me and that's to belong to my family. Um, and um, I probably pr represent a theme, a very different path. I, I, I was the sort of good Asian daughter who wanted to please everybody, make my parents proud and be a good wife and make everyone happy. So I was one of those people who took a while to actually find my path and what I really wanted to do. Um, and I'm really pleased now that I feel like I finally sort of got there slowly. Um, all the way through my medical course, I, all I knew was I wanted to do every specialty I did. Every term I did, ah, oh, hematology is fantastic. Oh my goodness. And, um, you know, public health was inspirational and emergency medicine was an adrenaline ride. And um, I just thought, oh, I, I just can't decide what I want to do. And, and yet I was already developing quite a long term relationship with my husband here, and um, I knew I really wanted to, family is important in the Chinese culture. I knew I, I sort of wanted to be the perfect wife and have, all, have 10 children and be the best daughter to my parents and have, keep up with all my friends and have a great social life. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, and be a wonderful citizen and keep my eye on the news and write those letters to my local member and be a wonderful professional doctor and and then I just really wasn't sure what I wanted to do so um, for me it has been quite a journey of finding like what do I really do with my 16 hours of awake time every day. Um, so 
Um, when I was younger, I just felt like I could adapt to anything. It's like, yeah, it's great. General practice, it's great. Living overseas is fantastic. Living in the middle of Sydney, fantastic. And I just was one of those super flexible people who loved everything I did. And that was sort of great and then not so great when it came to decision time. So at the time I thought general practice, yeah, I think that'd be a good fit. It was pretty holistic, it was flexible. I felt I could be creative. I could spend time nurturing important relationships. There was so much variety and it suited my life circumstance because Harvey was keen on it too and I thought, oh, that'll work. Um, so we had a massive change of scene from Prince of Wales to um, New England Rural General Practice Training. Um, and I just never met people who walk around with their collars up with <laughs> baskets that are lined with lovely tablecloth material and <laughs> go shopping all made up with their hair beautifully done and sort of speak nicely to the shopkeepers and I thought, wow, this is a whole different part of Australia I've never seen before. <laughs> um, and then to Gunnedah with all the farmers and getting called out to people with their arms stuck in cotton pickers and all sorts of things. So, um, and then in Kempsey, sort of a rapid crash course in Aboriginal health um, and uh, a lot of coastal um, community issues. I, I really felt excited by my training and, and felt like I, I was catapulted out of wontons and, you know, <laughs> living in Sydney and having everything at your fingertips. I, I felt like, wow, you know, humans are diverse and this training's wonderful. I'm getting to really see, like, such a great range of people. Um, eventually, we loca did a lot of locums and decided to, um, that the Blue Mountains would be a good match for our hobbies and there were vacancies for two GPs at the same time, which was also two procedural GPs and also not too far from my family. So we thought, great, this is a good place to go. And I was able to combine general practice with procedural medicine and kind of explore a whole new life being coming from mega cities with my parents living to, in Sydney, which seemed like a small village, and then going out to live in towns of five to 10,000 people. Um, I, I had, um, there was a lot of um, discovery over this time of um, discovering the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, I found very small working communities to be either amazingly wonderful, like a family, or if it doesn't work well, it's actually quite toxic to be in a small town, um, you know, with the various towns we've worked in. I, I worked in one town where at the end of my six months there, they told me actually they weren't paying any overtime and had I read my contract and I decided to do so much overtime and didn't read my contract very carefully. So there were some very tough lessons around um, being judicious um, because you're contract bargaining for yourself. Every general practice is different and every deal is different. So look at your contracts very carefully. Um, we I, I started working with an eye surgeon just once a month and there were some um, terrible ocular catastrophes in Orange where he worked, where the traditional eye blocks, he didn't feel comfortable with the traditional eye blocks and 
it's really wonderful in general practice where the the one on work one on one working relationship allows you to kind of sit down and take the time to solve your own problems rather than be in a huge hospital bureaucracy where you're following so many policies and you're told what to do. So he and I did quite a bit of research and came up with, through my observation, that some of the more safer ways of injecting superficial anaesthetic can actually be a really safe way to provide deep, profound anaesthesia. So this, from this observation, we, I embarked on 10 years, five years of research and writing up and I submitted my paper to a few journals and was rejected because why would an anesthesia or ophthalmology journal want to publish something that a GP had discovered? Um, but finally, last October, um, I was able to publish my work and and I have had special, you know, corneal transplant surgeons from Prince Alfred bring me up to ask me to show them how it works and, and help them do difficult eye operations under much better operative conditions. And um, you can do that as a GP. You can, you can do anything you want. You can publish a paper in an ophthalmology journal without being an ophthalmologist. <laughs> And um, it, was, it was a project that really took my fancy. Um, and I love the fact that I can contribute now um, to the world and bring a safer and more effective way of anaesthetizing the eye for eye surgery. And cataract surgery alone is the third most commonly done procedure around the world. So that's a lot of people who can benefit from that. So, my lessons, you know, it's taken a long time to get to know myself and I can only echo what everyone else said is it's really worth taking the time to, to take time to find out what works for you. And I've, I've had a very, um, a very non-standard path through my career um, in rural, in, in full-time rural um, general practice with running rooms and hospital work, working about 70 hours a week and being woken up through the night quite often and doing that solidly through my 20s until I thought, oh, that's enough. <laughs> and the biological clock ticked. And I'm really glad I listened to that because some of my friends have missed the boat when they suddenly turned 40 and thought, oh, I better start trying something and got to 45 and missed the boat. And I tell all my med students that if you think you want to have kids, please plan for it. Too many people miss the boat. Another thing that I really discovered was when, when there is no, when things go wrong or when you, when your knowledge comes to its limits and you can't exactly help someone. I've learned through the years that actually we are the therapeutic agent. We, just by understanding people and being with them and just by being empathetic and caring and being consistent, that we can be the only therapeutic agent left after everything else fails. Um, so, and this picture was actually, um, this painting was actually commissioned um, by someone whose daughter died of um, scarlet fever and he was um, moved to commission this picture because the doctor sat by and held up the family and kept everyone comforted and cared for, even though they had no antibiotics and they couldn't help this girl with scarlet fever. Um, and I think general practice is probably one of the disciplines where the doctor can very much be the most potent therapeutic agent. 
So, looking into the future, I, I don't know if anyone's heard of this Sensely app. It's the new general practice robot that runs out of the UK. And you can pay £98 or something a year and have 24-hour GP consults with this robot. And it's an app on the App Store. Um, I've never tried it. I didn't want to pay my £98. <laughs> but there's been quite a lot of talk about the role of technology um, in the future in general practice. I haven't been affected by that. I just thought I'd show you guys and get you thinking. Because I think you will probably be working with technology and be thinking about how you can value add above and beyond technology. How you can be the therapeutic agent that a sensory robot can't. So the National Health has a virtual health assistant just below there and you can talk to the chat robot 24 hours a day about your symptoms and your problems. So that'll bring a new shade of practice. Um, so this is where I think the GP can be totally irreplaceable. And that is, um, I think our patients, humans, our community, we long for a connection and we are part of that connection. And we, we can, we, we can read between the lines and when someone's talking about one problem, we can say, hmm, you know, is this related to maybe, you know, your relationship, is your stage of life, your, um, you know, what's happening in your work and um, all those wonderful sixth sense kind of qualities that I think will never be replaced by robots. <clears throat> and probably the most wonderful thing is to find meaning in what you do and find satisfaction um, in your choice, um, which we we'll probably go down a few blind alleys, but um, this is a great book, by the way, if you, if you get the chance to read it. So, wishing you all well in discovering what matters and what's important over time. And I know for us, I um, changed my entire career path, my work, where I live, where my kids go to school, when my dad developed dementia, and to give him a few precious years to um, live with his family and not go to a nursing home. We now, as rural GPs, live in Bondi. <laughs> and you just have to make these. I made that decision in two or three weeks. I think my husband thought, hang on, we just bought a house and did a renovation. Are we moving? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but the paint's not dry. I mean, we, we haven't even... No, sorry. Dad's got dementia. And he got lost. He slept two nights in the gutters. I'm sorry. We have to move next week. <laughs> so for me, you know, that family connection was so important for me that just changed everything. I didn't see it coming. And um, I've made some big decisions and I've been glad that I've made them when I've wanted to and, and it's been what mattered. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, well, for me, general practice was wonderfully flexible, and that was amazing. I, I did my FRA, CGP, and Vacrum first, and then my anaesthetic bent led me to train in anaesthetics, 
and really it's chalk and cheese. When I um, got pregnant, I had to have the worst hyperemesis I've ever heard of <laughs> in my whole medical career. I just threw up like multiple times a day. I threw up when I got out of bed. So I was really bedridden for nine months, twice, and my obstetrician <laughs> threatened to put an NG tube down to feed me at one stage. Um, and um, it was very difficult. And the College of Anaesthetists were very, very extremely inflexible. I'd passed my primary writtens. I'd asked to change my viva just for two days so I can get IV fluids. No, you failed your viva and you have failed your writtens as well because you automatically fail your writtens if you don't do your viva. That's $3,000 later as well. So <laughs> that's a comparison. For me, I realized you know, I, I, I was a slow learner. In my third trimester, I sat the anaesthetic primaries again and I passed it all. And I was going to have my year off with the kids, but my child was allergic to dairy and couldn't take formula and had bloody diarrhea. And so I didn't go back. Um, I kept doing general practice. Then my second child, more hyperemesis, another nine months in bed throwing up. Um, and only to have tongue tie and very difficult breastfeeding. And then only to find that he was mute and he wasn't speaking and I stayed home to do intensive speech therapy. So you just never know what you'll get. Um, he breastfed by three and a half years <laughs> <laughs> He loved his breastfeeding. <laughs> um, well, he couldn't talk and he had hearing problems and the breastfeeding actually was very comforting. And he actually cleared his eustachian tube beautifully. So the audiologist said, it's the breastfeeding or it's grommets. And I thought, oh, well, if the breastfeeding is doing the job, why grommets? So... <laughs> um, I made, I think for me, when it comes to the crunch, I always make decisions in favour of people. Um, I just felt the career can just go around, but if my child misses an important window in speech development as a toddler, then that could set him back for the rest of his life. So. They were hard decisions. I, I spent $2,000 going to a career counsellor because I was just like, oh, I want to publish my research. Oh, I want to get that grant. Oh, I want to do this. And at the end of the day, I thought, no, I, I really just want my kid to be able to talk and communicate. <laughs> so um, um, with, I tried to do the whole anaesthetic training thing it was very, very unfriendly. Um, I ended up writing um, my thesis for um, the research project for FANSCA and I won the college prize for that. And I wanted to have part-time work. People were saying, look, if you win the college prize, they'll probably let you go part-time. No. <laughs> They were so inflexible. I have to say, my experience was terrible. And that was when I thought, okay, that's it. That's the end of anaesthetic training. I'm going to vote for my family, not for the college. So, um, yeah, it was. I, I made I made really hard decisions, gut wrenching decisions for me. Um, and I'm really glad at the end of the day. I just looked after my family and my health and I let my various um, big opportunities go. And now I still work, I still have some, um, I, I work in Lithgow, I have a wonderful rural procedural general practice and I get asked to do corneal transplants by the RPA surgeon because he likes my anaesthetic the best. So I have a very weird kind of spread of work. Um, 
which is all okay. And the boys are really healthy. And my mute child eventually spoke. And that was the greatest joy for me. I, when he did decide to talk, I ran out of time for my anaesthetic training. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to fall off the training scheme. And really, I couldn't care less in the end because I knew all that time I spent with him really paid off. And, he, and my, my two boys currently are really thriving and happy. So. Could, could I just stop at... Um... For those of you who if you do have medical partners or other partners, um, I think in this era of, of gender respect, it's really important to have, I suppose, flexibility of, of, and respect of those career options. So at the moment, uh, I do a long week of work up in Lithgow and I'm home dad for a week in Bond up in Queen Park. And so Shane does more of her work on the weeks where I'm home dad and dad. So, which is great. I mean, I don't see them during the other week, but I'm very engaged in that week when there. So it's not ideal. You can't have it all, but, um, but the, it's what we can do to save our lives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our speakers tonight. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have five GPs with such a diverse career um, experience speak to us tonight. And I'm sure many of your messages uh, will resonate for uh, a long time with many of our audience tonight. I would now like to quickly uh, invite Nicole to announce the door prize winner. Can I just ask how many of you have keyboard general practice? Yay! <laughs> Ebony? Oh, she left early. Oh. 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 Thank you so much for everyone uh, for attending. I would now uh, like to ex extend a sincere thank you to all of our team of GBSN for working hard behind the scenes. Laura, Charlotte, Pia, Tom, Justin and Rhiannon, but especially to Christian, who has been the rock to this event. So, uh, uh, as a token of appreciation, I asked Pia from GPSN, uh, our team, to hand a small gift to each of the speakers. That concludes the night, everyone. Have a good night.